Uh, welcome. So here with our friend Sarah Wilson, uh, amazing New York Times bestselling author. Honored to have her. She wrote a great book, I Quit Sugar. But today we're here to talk about anxiety because another book that you might know Sarah was called... First, comma, we make the beast beautiful. It's a beautiful Not name. Not quite Boom. catchy though, is it? No. Boom. Very but uh, so anxiety is something that's prolific nowadays with phones, comparing yourself to other people with insomnia, with stress. Life seems to become more and more demanding for most people and demands really in terms of how we should be, how we need to be. We need to be nice. We need to be kind. We need to meditate. We need to have abs. We need to do our Instagram photo. I mean, you know, X, Y, Z. So I think anxiety is something that's prolific in our society and Sarah's really gone on her own journey for over seven years. She met with the Dalai Lama, met with Oprah's people, met with all sorts of different people and has really gone on her journey. And she's got some tips now on how to help with reducing anxiety in our lives. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting because it's sort of two types of anxiety. By the way, thanks for the lovely intro. Oh, um, no, and I should actually be really upfront and honest because that's part of my thing about what I do is that I've had anxiety since I was probably eight or nine and it's played itself out as a whole range of so-called disorders. And what I wanted to do was start a conversation that went beyond the medical model where you're labelled with this thing. And I wanted to basically connect at the point where I could actually modulate my anxiety but then harness it and use it as a superpower. And Brilliant. I wow. have run a business. Like, Thank uh, you. Great, uh, great concept. Um, I've run a business. I've written various books. I travel the world. As I was saying to you earlier, I live out of a suitcase, you know, and back, I did that back, for really. eight years. And so I've done a whole bunch of things that people would say is anxiety causing or at least would be very difficult with anxiety. But that's because I've tried to harness what I have and use it in the way that we used to use it throughout history before it became medicalized. So to answer one of the questions that you were asking me earlier about what is anxiety and how do you know if you've had it, there's everyday anxiety. The flight or fight mechanism is really just a natural way of us making sure we survive. And it's really normal to feel anxiety. What's happened is our culture doesn't embrace that and doesn't encourage people to feel okay with it. And we've often been medicalized and told that there's an issue there and you shouldn't feel this way. You should feel happy all the time. And, and that's not the human experience. Then, of course, there's mm. disordered anxiety, which is pretty legit and has existed throughout history. So evolutionary biologists have found that 1.2 to 1.4% of any population, whether it's here in Ireland, whether it's in Manhattan, whether it's in Madagascar, have bipolar, obsessive compulsive disorder and a bunch of other so-called disordered wow, anxieties. Just part of, just part of it's part of our evolutionary sort of setup. Wow. And what is being postulated and in fact proven to be very, very true is that we need a percentage of the population to have these very heightened sensitivities. And that is to ensure we keep safe, but also so we innovate. So, you know, I always say that it was the bipolar kid that went over the hill that nobody else was game enough to do and went, hey, guys, I've just been over there. It's been great. The wheel. We should get onto this thing, you know. And then they did some um, studies in the 1960s with chimpanzees and these chimps displayed, um, they had a population and they had a population that, or part of the population that displayed OCD behaviors you know they were fastidious they're on the outside of the crowd they didn't really have mates they'd stay awake all night and what do you know when they removed them from the clan the clan died out in six months because they relied on these quirky little chimps to keep them safe wow. <laughs> So I when think you that's start, a wonderful context that, that we've so, forgotten about in modern day society. So really what I'm getting here, it's it's reframing anxiety in our modern society is perceived as negative and it's you're yeah. diseased in a sense or problematic or something. That's Whereas right. Whereas it's reframing it into positive where, as you say, it gives you a superpower. You have a heightened sense of awareness yep. and probably more energy and you know, well, I started out and... in my journalism career 25 years ago as a restaurant reviewer because my sense of smell is so acute. And then, of course, I moved into food and cookbooks. And, and I go down these rabbit holes of research. Like, I couldn't have written the book I wrote, First We Make the Beast Beautiful, for seven years if I didn't have that very intense kind of focus that comes from having bipolar or so-called bipolar. Mm. So if anyone's listening at home, I think it's really important to get a diagnosis and to um, get help. And I've taken medication throughout my life and I still take it when I need it. But what I do is I keep in the back of my mind that there's a bigger picture here. And that's not to say it's easy. No. So if you're one of those 1.2 to 1.4% of the population who have what's called a disorder, and it plays out as panic disorder and there's a whole bunch of them, 
it, it ain't easy. It's kind of, you know, like a pain in the ass to be that person. Mm. But it makes it so much easier if you know that there's kind of a purpose to it mm. and you can actually steer it, you know. So 70% of poets, 70% of scientists are either have some kind of disordered anxiety, so bipolar or OCD in general. Wow. Um, the best wartime leaders throughout history had bipolar. So I think Winston Churchill. Because they were able to keep just so... They know how to uh, respond in an emergency. They can rise and take a population with them and guide them. Almost that like they're burning adrenaline. Like, you know, the way when I think if I'm anxious, I'm burning adrenaline. I'm yeah. burning, like, I've, it's almost like caffeine. Like They it's, naturally it's... work at a high octane level. Yeah, yeah. Now, it has the price to pay, of course. But as wartime it. leaders... That's what everybody needed. And, you know, in, in this country, everybody knew Winston had neurotics, you mm. know, and that was accepted. But everyone has neurotics. It's well, the one thing I'm more aware of. Yeah, what, 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 what would your tips that, like, uh, everything you're saying is fabulous, incredibly fabulous. I'm just wondering, like, for those at home, anyone who has anxiety, we all have it at various different times during yeah. our day with different our levels. lives and different levels. What would your tips be to kind of managing or helping... Um, modulate it yeah mod mod I think that's a great word modulate. it is a good because you just don't the way I describe it is you don't you want to fly your kite yeah because what else is life about yeah you want to fly your kite you want to soar up to great heights at times but you don't want the rope to get slack so the kite flips and flops all over the place you want to kind of keep it nice and firm and not too far away from earth you know you need to ground yourself yeah. so some of the principles that I work to and like you said I traveled the world for seven years researching this mm. book and trying out things and investigating the science on it. Um, they're really basic and they're all free. It worked me, oh, took me a while to work out that everything that I was sharing that actually worked was free. So, which is great news for everybody who's at home and feels that it's kind of almost a step too far. So the number one thing that I do that works and has the most abundant legitimate science is walking so what's really interesting is the part of the brain that formed when we emerged from the primordial soup and kind of uh operated the way we walked is also the part of the brain that controls the flight or fight response it's the prefrontal cortex and it's a gnarly part of the brain that's kind of like your, your kind of your second uncle or your great uncle he can only do one thing at once <laughs> so when you it's definitely walk, a he it's definitely a yeah, he yeah 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 we all know that uncle um <laughs> When you walk, you actually find it very hard to get anxious. So it's the cheapest, most effective fix. Now, um, the Japanese have done countless studies, like hundreds of studies on this, and they now have this thing called forest therapy, and it's now played out in oh, China and South Korea. Fern therapy, isn't it? Forest, 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 forest therapy, yeah. 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 And there's a whole science around it, and the government sponsors all these programs to help with stressed out um, Japanese people and um, so there's all these studies that show walking in nature in particular but even just walking in your city or your suburb or whatever just the movement you can't get anxious well it, it gives you an outlet I know anytime before we're doing a talk or doing any type of a public presentation, presentation, or, presentation or, something. or something there's always some degree of anxiety or some of degree of heightened there should be. nervous yeah, nervousness and yeah. we'll always do handstands or walk or run yep. or something to give an outlet to just yeah, so the walking the walking thing has a whole I mean I cite a lot of the studies in my book and I explain it so that you can actually work out the best way to go about walking, which really is not that complicated. Tie on shoes and walk out the door is pretty much it. The second thing, and it's kind of related science, the decision making part of your brain, right, also evolved in that same part of the, the prefrontal cortex. And it's also affected by anxiety. So if you've got to make a lot of decisions, you'll get anxious. And anyone watching this, I'm sure you understand that wow. when you've got all these decisions to make. It makes a lot of sense in your state. And you're like this. And having to choose is really, really stress-inducing. Flip side, if you're anxious, you can't make decisions. So when I'm at the depths of my despair and I'm having a complete meltdown, as I did in London and I sat in the gutter of Oxford Street a couple of weeks ago and just lost it. Um, and I was, I couldn't move. I was, I couldn't even work out if I turned left or right. That's the space I get to with decision making right. when I'm that anxious. And um, what, what, yeah, so you basically can't make decisions. So what the fix is, is to make less decisions. So Barack Obama, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, when he was still alive, all worked this science. So they actually have cited it in various books and interviews. What they do is they all wear the same outfit. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Black yeah. skivvy jeans, white sneakers. Um, Barack Obama wore two suits throughout the 
entirety of his presidency and he cites Could their science. Decision-making. They all eat a boring breakfast. So I've interviewed life hacks, over 100 life hacks through, throughout the, the years, <laughs> over 10 years. That's hilarious. They right? all eat a boring breakfast. They don't go, oh, do I have eggs benedict or do I have avocado on toast? They I just have the one thing. Yeah, wow. And the more decisions you can limit in the morning, it frees up your brain to make better decisions later and to be less anxious. So automate your life as much as possible. Me, for the morning, anyway. non-negotiable, I exercise. I just tie on shoes, get out the door. Um, I meditate, non-negotiable. I don't go, oh, Wednesdays and Thursdays, do I meditate? Oh, no, I'll do it on Friday. I just do it. Even if it's like for 10 minutes because I'm rendered choiceless, I just do it. So there's a bunch of things that I automate so that's that brilliant. I free up the anxious part of the brain. That's for me. Like, I think that's a, like often, like I swim in the sea at sunrise every day and I get up and like the first kind of half hour of my day, it's very ritual. Like it's like I get up, like it's nearly, you don't like, even think about it's it. nearly like a clock and often I'm kind of going, well, why? Like, am I really that robotic? But when mm-hmm. you say it like that, it's like, there's a huge comfort in it. Yeah. Like it's very... Absolutely. I guess the other thing I would say, um, which I just mentioned, is meditating. Meditating has changed my life. And it's a lot of people say, especially if they've got anxiety, it's really hard to still the brain. And that can be anxiety inducing. And what I say is, and it's not my idea, it's not a particularly original idea, it's not so much what you're doing while you're meditating. Like I'm a shit meditator. I've been meditating for about, I think it's eight years now. I'm, I'm a shit meditator but (laughs) it's played out in the rest of my life my head's going all over the place and everything but the process of coming back to your mantra or back to your breath that process of drawing yourself from the chaos back into yourself over and over again even if it's a struggle and even if it's tedious that basically reprograms the grooves in your brain to do that in the rest of your life when things get tense or kind of anxious so if you struggle with meditation, don't despair. It's part of the process. And in fact, my meditation teacher said this to me once. He said, Sarah, the fact you struggle with it actually means the benefits of meditation when it plays out in the rest of your life are going to be even more extraordinary because I am so used to doing that bounce backwards and forwards, you know, from freneticness back to myself, freneticness back to myself. Brilliant. Amazing. You're fabulous. You're so wonderful to listen to. Thank really, you. Yeah. Thank really, really, really you. is. Uh, if you've got any comments about anxiety if you suffer from it or what works for you leave them down below and, and to try to build a, tr- a thread and use this community to support each other so that we can all reframe yeah. anxiety from being this negative and thing to actually to being a superpower ask me questions I've, I, I, I try to answer them as often as I can on my various platforms um, and of course the book um, explores in real time my journey through this and I, and I share the moments where I'm naked in my house, when I say house, it's an Airbnb that I've landed in with my one suitcase, and I write out my panic attack and I actually explore it in real time. So it's kind of a journey where I hold people's hands and I say, let's go and investigate this together. So wow. I've Sounds just sold in my own book, haven't I? Amazing. Yeah, yeah, right. I don't read books very often, but I love to read them. Brilliant. <laughs> yes. uh, dude, check it's on audio Sarah. book too. <laughs> yeah, do check out Sarah on social media and everything. She's wonderful. Sarah Wilson on Instagram, on Facebook, on... Yeah, around little little dot. SarahWilson.com. Yeah. 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 yeah, you won't you will be able to find it pretty easy. Uh, thank you for watching you. Wishing you a good day and go forth and let's reframe anxiety to a superpower. Woo!